the stochastic approaches his group has developed in this area. So Simon, thank you again for uh, uh, giving us a, a talk today and the floor is yours. Great, well, uh, thanks Eric for the, for the invitation. It's a real honor to be taking part in this. It's, it's become a very uh, eminent uh, series, I think I've been uh, attending whenever I can. And, uh, you know, there are, there are not many advantages to lockdown, but maybe this is a, a slight one because we can, uh, we can have meetings with uh, international colleagues much more easily than when we had to travel. But nevertheless, I'm sure we all look forward to meeting in person again before too long. Great. So, yeah, I decided to talk about um, uh, this topic, uh, which uh, we promoted this idea of couple of physics imaging as this name, but sometimes called hybrid imaging, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. It, it's, and, uh, but in particular, though, I'll talk about the, the various combination of acoustics and uh, optics, which has had perhaps some of the, uh, the main uh, advances uh, compared with some of the other applications. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be talking uh, a bit of the background and some general uh, a survey of some of the things we've done, but then we have some, some new material. So there's the structure of the talk here. I'll talk a bit about modeling optics, modeling sound, and then uh, some uh, standard ways of doing reconstruction in one of these methods we call photoacoustics, photoacoustic tomography. And uh, I don't have a lot of learning in this, uh, learned methods, AI stuff in this talk, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about a particular approach, uh, which we call a fast approximate forward model. And then uh, I talk about the, the other aspect of this, which is the, the quantitative aspect. So this is where you are really coupling the, the modalities and deriving optical properties directly from photoacoustic and also from another modality called ultrasound modulated optical tomography. And the difference being that in, in, the, uh, in the plain photoacoustic tomography case, it's essentially, it's quantitative, but it's not very interpretable. Uh, and then I want to talk, uh, I want to get time to talk about something new we've done, which is uh, we call fully stochastic reconstruction, where we are making use of some of some machine learning methods in particular stochastic gradient descent methods uh, and applying it to problems which are where the model is also stochastic that's why we call it fully stochastic so I, I hope that I go through the background material quick enough to get to that uh, okay so um, let me say um, right away uh, I didn't put a long list of co-authors but I want to make it clear that um, there are many people that uh, worked with over many years and uh, this is just a subset of them because this is the people that uh, have really helped with the work that I'm presenting today but uh, there's many more people collaborated with over the years so I hope I uh, don't leave anybody out misrepresent them great so um, when we talk about uh, imaging for coupled physics or coupled physics imaging, the rationale comes from, or you might actually call it a post hoc rationale because it wasn't, it wasn't that one sat down and uh, discovered, uh, tried to invent a method because of this motivation, but uh, the, uh, we find that we have some advantages and we can uh, consider them like this. When, when we have established modalities, CT, MRI, ultrasound, uh, which are commercially available in most hospitals. Actually, the reconstruction algorithms are usually simple uh, under certain conditions where the data is sufficient. Uh, and that's uh, tantamount to saying that the inverse problem is well posed or perhaps just mildly ill posed. So in the case of CT, it's just uh, this polynomial decay in the single spectrum and it's uh, not catastrophically uh, deteriorated by noise. 
But actually, so, uh, in many cases, again, it's difficult to be general, but in many cases, we don't have a very strong contrast uh, precisely because the, the contrast that you're looking for, the objects we're looking for, are not interfering strongly with the probing wave. They're not um, uh, producing nonlinear effects or changing the uh, front wave front substantially. On the other hand, uh, there are uh, ever ever increasing number of uh, so-called novel imaging modalities, some not so novel anymore, EIT, which, which this community knows very well, diffuse optical tomography and microwave imaging, very often um, characterized by uh, parameter identification in PDE approaches. And they are, they are a very strong interest in applications because they give you uh, images, a contrast of parameters that we don't normally look at, like electrical conductivity, permittivity, optical absorption. But then the reconstruction algorithms are often more complex. Inverse problems often strongly opposed and usually nonlinear. But they continue to be uh, highly uh, motivated because uh, we have very high contrast because essentially the, the contrasting objects are disturbing the wave that you're using to uh, generate the signal quite strongly. So what, what we can think of is in this imaging from couple physics is that they are trying to combine the best of both worlds. They say we generate contrast from one mechanism, but we actually read it out and record the data using another one. And this is quite different to multimodality, which, which basically means uh, we simply have a number of uh, images taken uh, simultaneously, such as uh, PET CT is, is a common one, and PET MR is less common but becoming better known. And these are these are essentially a matter of data fusion, where we obtain several images, we have them in the same reference frame, so we can uh, stack the um, information at each pixel or voxel. And so some of these ICP methods. Photoacoustic imaging, which I'll, I'll talk mostly about. Uh, Thermoacoustic imaging, which is a, a very similar mathematically using a microwave uh, detection rather than, sorry, microwave signal generation rather than uh, photon. Acoustic optic imaging, which I'll also talk about. And uh, some other ones like MREIT, current density IT, and various forms of elastography, which I won't be talking about. So if I now just, just talk about uh, photoacoustics, uh, it tries to take this uh, best of both worlds. We, if we look at optical imaging, such as, as optical tomography, diffuse optical tomography, very highly interest because we have high intrinsic contrast based upon optical absorption and scattering. We have spectroscopic specificity, uh, gives us chemical information functional imaging of physiological parameters like blood oxygenation, but it has a, a catastrophic resolution um, because uh, the signal is strongly limited by optical scattering. Uh, it's exponentially opposed and nonlinear. Ultrasound imaging, on the other hand, uh, comes in many flavors, the, the classic echo, uh, echo imaging, B-mode ultrasound, is uh, quite qualitative. You get images of soft tissue. You can get high spatial resolution, uh, depths hundreds of micrometers to millimeters, uh, large penetration depth, uh, so down to maybe tens of centimeters. Uh, but the physiological information is maybe weak, but of course we can get dynamic blood flow imaging and so forth. But it has a weak contrast by certain important targets, such as microvasculature and limited specificity with respect to chemical uh, differences in the um, tissues. So photoacoustic tomography is the best of both. So we'll say a bit more about that, how it works, but uh, it, you can think of it in this kind of way in that there's two pieces to it. There's an optical part, we uh, works by uh, using pulses of light, which cause a uh, rapid uh, absorption and a greater kind of uh, rapid expansion that's sort of too fast to dissipate by uh, convection or conduction and is converted to acoustic energy. 
Uh, so we have this, this kind of optical problem where we can study in terms of propagation light. And then often the, the, the topic of photoacoustics starts here. It starts with uh, the pressure. It's like a shock wave that's generated by the deposition of energy internally. And then it, it propagates to the boundary where it can detect it. And uh, Li Hong Wang likes to talk about it as the analogy of uh, thunder and lightning. If you have a flash of lightning, it creates this rapid uh, thermal shock, which is converted to sound. And one can uh, find the source of a sound of a lightning strike if you have three observers and they measure the, they see the light and measure the time that it takes for the light to, uh, the sound to arrive and they know the speed of sound, you can uh, triangulate on the source. Um, so uh, the, the key thing from the inverse point of view is that this, this uh, part is, is well posed. Uh, you, in most cases, if you have sufficient data, we can reconstruct the optical, uh, the, this initial pressure, in other words, localizing the lightning, if you will, quite uh, stably. And then one has a, an inverse problem, which is nonlinear, uh, but it's using what's called internal data. We're not measuring boundary data, which is, which is um, an inverse boundary value problem, that's such as the uh, Calderon problem or related uh, inversions of uh, Dirichlet and Norman maps or Dirichlet or Robin maps or variations on that. But you actually have internal data. So one has a better chance of recovering quantitative values. Still, it's technically difficult to do. And uh, there is a large amount of uh, systems in the literature which um, which uh, is to implement this in, in, a, in a wide variety of ways, which I, I won't exactly discuss today. But the, the system that uh, we have in, in our labs at UCL looks like this, and it has in particular a um, an optical readout, which is converting the pressure waves back into optical interference patterns. And so it can be read in, in uh, with a uh, uh, technically an arbitrary precision accuracy. But I'll talk more about that later. But I also want to mention another uh, modality, which is ultrasound modulated optical tomography, where uh, one puts a coherent beam of light into uh, a scattering medium and one uses an ultrasound source uh, to modulate the density of the scatterers. And then we observe the change in the speckle uh, modulation on the output. Uh, so this uh, again has, has a different mathematical setting, but uh, by using this ultrasound focus, if ideally you could localize this uh, change in density to a single voxel and scan it through, uh, one could um, obtain a, a reconstruction uh, to arbitrary accuracy. But because the pulse is not completely well localized, that's not straightforward and because um, we still need to disentangle this uh, recovered uh, change in density into optical absorption scattering. So again, we use an optical model. And here, uh, one 3D reconstruction using a optical model, uh, different absorption and scattering targets. And here the reconstruction with the uh, values shown on this plane through a cylinder and uh, some percentage error for the localization of the targets. So I'll, I'll say a bit more about that uh, later. Okay, so we see that we have these two uh, things to deal with. The modeling of uh, light, if you want to use, um, solve an inverse optical problem, the modeling of sound, for the inverse acoustic problem, and then somehow to couple. So the modeling of light uh, can, can start with Maxwell's equations, which are um, uh, very difficult to solve on, on the scale of problems we want to uh, image because they have um, uh, wavelengths of many millions of uh, wavelengths per uh, across the uh, domain size. So normally uh, another way uses a, a phenomenological model the, the radiative transfer equation, which uh, in its simplest form is just a transportation of uh, the uh, so-called radiance, which is the uh, density of photons at any given point in any given direction, is transportation in a particular direction, S height, 
has had is uh, just uh, affected by attenuation along that line. So if we had a in zero scattering and we have a array, collimated ray propagating along a line, it's attenuated exponentially. Uh, so we'll call this the ray transform uh, for this absorption parameter uh, in this direction. And it gives rise to the well-known ray transform. And if we just uh, reformulate it with the log, then we arrive at uh, the, the radon transform or the ray transform in 3D, which is of course the basis of X-ray imaging. X-ray CT, but, but the problem uh, is when we have uh, scattering, uh, we add another term that uh, takes photons away from the direction of propagation and we have photons that um, propagate into the direction of propagation. And we can write this in this uh, in the, the term of the difference of these two operators, this uh, ray attenuation, which is now parameterized by the sum of absorption scattering and this uh, rescattering operator here. And one way we might try to tackle this is by expanding it in a, a Neumann series, uh, which is called the method of successive approximation in Sobolev's book, uh, which you can see uh, amounts to saying that uh, we decompose the um, this radiance into the term that's just directly propagated just by solving uh, this inverse ray, uh, ray transform uh, for a directional source, terms which are propagated, rescattered and propagated, and then those uh, taken uh, multiple times up to infinity. And if we rearrange this, we put the first scattered rays on the right and, and then rescatter them once, we obtain this so-called um, collided flux model, which says that we that some of what you measure is uh, the so-called ballistic photons, those that are unscattered and just attenuated. Uh, and then the resulting photons that are rescattered and repropagated from that called the collided flux in some, some of the literature. And so if you if you solve this, uh, we can start with a very weak scattering. So in this in this picture, we have um, uh, this parameter m mu s is uh, mu s is inverse length n is the number of pixels. So this n mu s it gives us a, a total scattering length. So the survival probability is the is e to the negative of this. So the, so the chances that the photon is unscattered is e to the negative 1.728, which is not so low. So the solution looks like a propagating decaying beam with some propagation out of the beam. And as we increase this, so if we go through these and we look at these uh, numbers, that probability of scattering is increasing and the ray is attenuating more, it's decaying faster. And also the uncollided, uh, the collided flux is increasing until we get something that looks uh, very much like a diffuse field. It's just some chances of a ballistic comp component being measured have become increasingly unlikely. And so uh, another more popular model is got by uh, reparameterizing this radiance into spherical harmonics and retaining only a sum of terms. Uh, so the uh, zeroth term is called the uh, fluence and the uh, first order term, the uh, photon current. And then with some, some fairly straightforward algebra, we can rearrange this into the so-called diff diffusion equation model. And so a lot of optical homography is done with this model because it's easy to solve. And a certain amount is done with the uh, radiator transfer model. And then possibly this combination through use taking some of the uh, initial scattered photons on the, as the source term for, for a uh, radiator transfer solver. But these uh, computations become increasingly difficult to do. But there's a, an alternative to it, which is the uh, Monte Carlo approach. And uh, I'll just run this video, unfortunately, I couldn't make this very slow, but uh, the Monte Carlo model simply uh, stochastically propagates photons. Uh, so we see roughly the same effect here. And rather than we're not changing the um, scattering density anywhere, we're just modeling with increasing number of photons. And if I, if I stop that, yes. Uh, so variety we have sufficient number of photons model. So each photon that just is randomly propagated 
and then uh, randomly rescatter and randomly propagate. So it's under it's essentially looking uh, at sampling the successive terms in the Neumann series. And then photons that are detected uh, make it to the boundary are counted as detected. And then what is usually done is that this needs to be run sufficiently uh, long time in order that this approaches the, um, the converged solution to within whichever tolerance we like. So it's a quasi deterministic model when you have sufficient photons. Okay, uh, let's now just turn to the modeling of sound uh, before we come back and uh, put these things together. So um, the uh, simplest uh, model that's pertinent to pert acoustics is uh, wave equation and the um, with point detectors. So assuming isotropic uh, constants uh, speed, uh, sorry, not constant speed, but uh, uh, speed expressed uh, through uh, the uh, well, the refractive index rather than through the um, particle density. Then we have uh, just the second order uh, wave equation with an initial condition and usually the uh, derivative at zero is taken to be zero as well. And then the data is observed on some boundary uh, but the model doesn't, it's not treated as a boundary condition. The, the wave is assumed to propagate to uh, infinity uh, and simply measured on some uh, domain boundary. So we, in our terms, we would write this as a mapping from a spatial distribution in 3D to a distribution on a uh, surface uh, as a function of time. So if the speed is constant, then the signal detected in observation point is the sum of waves arriving from a given distance, given by the time times the speed. So this is described by the spherical mean transform, uh, which we can state in, in this form, that the uh, FRT on, on the surface uh, is given by the, the integral over spheres of uh, center to R and radius uh, CT. And uh, this leads to uh, analytic conversions uh, when you can use the adjoint of M as the basis for back projection and back filter back projection formula just as in X-ray CT. Uh, some other uh, variations arise uh, through using integrating detectors. So if you use a plane detector, uh, then uh, the problem uh, inverts to a, a 3D radon transform. Uh, if we use line detectors, as you can find in these papers, uh, then we convert to um, taking data on a circle corresponding to a 2D circular mean radon transform. And then this, uh, the plane of that circle is rotated to obtain uh, enough data for a 2D inverse radon transform. These all have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, when we consider heterogeneous sound speed, there are uh, some more um, uh, limited options for the reconstruction because the uh, analytic formula won't apply. If, we, uh, if the sound speed is known, then we can define a uh, final speed, uh, which is the analog of uh, just the uh, speed times the uh, radius of the domain in the homogeneous case. Uh, we define it as the supremum of the time it takes for the ray to reach uh, the measurement boundary over all rays originating in the domain. And um, unless we have a particularly difficult problem uh, called, known as trapping, uh, this will be a, a finite number. And uh, if we have, if we measure to any time uh, greater than that maximum time, uh, we will obtain sufficient data for a unique recovery of the initial pressure. So from Stefanov and Ullman, 2009, if uh, sound speed is smooth and non-trapping as we just described and the domain is closed, then if uh, we can define the minimal time for a, by which at least one of each pair of rays propagates from inside to outside, then the data measured uh, up to any time greater than that 
uh, minimal time is sufficient for the immediate recovery. Uh, if C is unknown, uh, we can try to reconstruct C. Uh, to do that from photoacoustic data alone is non-unique. Um, so we will need some auxiliary measurement like uh, ultrasound computer tomography, a transmission uh, ultrasound measurement. Uh, somewhat analogous to, to the problem in SPECT and PET where we, if we have the unknown attenuation coefficient, uh, we can make use of a auxiliary transmission uh, measurement to uh, estimate absorption before uh, using it in the model to uh, recover source distribution. So uh, looking at how the reconstruction is done, as I mentioned, uh, there are some back rejection formula. So um, work in the uh, early 21st century by authors like Finch, Hatch, Rakesh. Uh, if, uh, if we have uh, complete data on the surface of water radius R, then uh, we can write reconstruction formula in several different ways. And as with uh, X-ray CT, the uh, integration in uh, over the sphere is the constitutes the back projection, and the differentiation in space constitutes filtering. Uh, in two thousand five, uh, Zhu and Wang extended this to the universal back projection formula for other geometries uh, like uh, sphere cylinders and planes and extension to arbitrary uh, dimension greater than two by Kunyansky. Uh, lots of details can be found in the book by Kushman. Uh, another approach by Kunyansky is to use eigenvalue expansions. So if we take the uh, eigen system of the Laplacian with the Richelieu boundary conditions, then we can uh, find the representation for the, green, uh, for the uh, Green's function in free space and we can recover uh, U by taking its normal derivative on the boundary and using a Green's function propagator. Uh, and then uh, the particular eigenfunction depends on the basis in which we can uh, represent the initial pressure. So uh, results obtained for um, simple geometries, uh, particularly uh, in cubes who have the eigenfunction of trigonometric functions or in other geometries like spheres uh, where we can write down the analytic form in terms of the special functions in that geometry. Uh, then we, we could mention a, uh, a method we call the fast Fourier method, which is amenable to uh, when we have a detector on a planar surface. This is something I'm going to come back to when we look at this uh, fast approximate model. Let's keep an eye on the time. Um, the idea is if you take the Fourier transform of the data on, on a plane and we take the uh, Fourier transform in time to the harmonic variable omega, then uh, they obey the dispersion relation through to the wave equation. And we squared is C k squared. Uh, this gives a, um, uh, a grid. If we sample this grid, it's evenly spaced in KZ. Then we can write a scaling factor and an interpolation function to go from a regular omega grid to a regular KZ grid. And then use an inverse Fourier transform. This looks like this if we um, take the uh, regular grid in omega and kz, the dispersion relationship are these uh, level sets, which are circles, and the scaling relation has this kind of butterfly representation. So we go from a regular sampling in kz omega space uh, to a non, an irregular sampling in kx kz space. Uh, if we implement that, if we look at this uh, example, we start with a, a point inside a square domain. If this is a source of waves, they're propagating out of circles and they arrive if we detect on this upper surface and represent the data as a function of time and distance. So here the, the spatial horizontal dimension is the same. And uh, this is now the time dimension. So the arriving wave set, the first arriving uh, energy arrives at the point closest to this source. And then 
as we look further along this domain, we see the wave arriving later. You take the Fourier transform of this data, it appears like this in uh, time and space. You rescale and regrid, and then inverse Fourier transform. This we recover uh, the original function uh, in a stable, fast way. And then finally, we have uh, time reversal. So if we look at the propagation, oops, sorry, uh, if we look at the propagation of waves from an object in the interior, we measure on the boundary. Then we, uh, the data consists of uh, all of the the points that are uh, on this boundary domain as a function of time. So we've gone from two dimensions of space to a dimension of uh, space and time. Uh, that's given again by this uh, wave equation with initial condition. This uh, forward mapping, as I mentioned before. And then inversion is done by back propagation. We use the adjoint uh, equation, which is the same with the data uh, placed on this uh, boundary gamma at the time of its measurement with a final condition uh, that uh, back, when we propagate back from time, final time to initial time, the final arriving pressure should be zero and its first derivative zero. And this looks like this. We just re recast the data onto each point and back propagate it in time. And when we stop at this initial time, uh, it reconstructs the initial data. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah, actually the uh, yeah, this time reversal operator is not identical to the adjoint operator. So we uh, need uh, slightly more machinery to do that. And we get slightly different results uh, between the time reversal, which is really the inverse and the, the adjoint, which is and not quite the inverse. And so it has some contrast change. But it, equipped with the inverse, uh, sorry, equipped with the adjoint, we can just use this within a, a variational framework for uh, propagation, back propagation and iteration with regularization in a numerical scheme. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about uh, compressed sensing. So we did um, uh, quite some activity on this uh, some years ago. And uh, as I mentioned in the uh, introduction to the system that's uh, installed in uh, London, it, uh, without going into too many details, it works by uh, looking at the interference patterns between a scanning beam uh, in an interferometer which whose thickness is varying due to the pre arriving pressure wave. So imagine we have a classic experiment of an interferometer that's being squeezed by the ultrasound pressure, uh, then it's creating interference patterns and they can be recorded by scanning and uh, scanning a beam across this device. And this um, was the original way that this uh, instrumentation was created, uh, in, at least in London. But the time of scanning can take several minutes. But it has this advantage that we can scan kind of to arbitrary uh, spatial precision, which means that we can increase the spatial reconstruction of the uh, 3D image up to um, the highest recorded frequency of, of uh, sound, which will determine the highest spatial frequency through the dispersion relationship. So the idea with, with uh, developing a compressed sensing approach was, um, actually maybe I'll just skip to, to this idea, is that we replace this setup with uh, one using something like a single pixel arrangement, where rather than recording by scanning, we record by uh, projecting patterns onto the surface uh, and resumming it optically into a photo detector. So very much classic as inspired by, by the original Rice single pixel camera and, and other single pixel camera implementations. And so the, the idea then is that we replace this measurement by points with a measurement of the inner product with a certain patterns. And therefore we uh, solve this by, in the, in the normal compressed sensing setting, by looking for a sparse reconstruction of a representation of the uh, uh, image, the P naught image in some basis, uh, encoded by uh, 
uh, psi. Uh, so typically a wavelet basis. And then uh, the measurements are the encoding by the measurement matrix phi. And uh, Marta Petka in particular has, has worked extensively on this and has shown results using a, a curvelet basis in uh, the spatial domain and a, a kind of modified curvelet basis in the space time domain of the signals. Uh, so this was successful, but it also um, is a little hard to realize in practice because it's predicated on how well this uh, pattern information can really spatially integrate this interferometer. And that, that at the present has some technical uh, shortcomings to it, uh, which are to do with the uh, quality of the uh, this interferometric device. If, if it has some, it has to be very high precision uh, in order to be able to ensure that its thickness is sufficiently well determined that, uh, that the integration with the pattern across that complies with this um, compression, uh, the, the RIP principle of compressed sensing. So uh, we actually in practice use just random point sampling. And this shows a uh, a video, this is work primarily done by, by Felix Luca, who's now at CWI in Amsterdam, using a variational setting, uh, using uh, TV denoising, time reversal, and a positivity constraint. And the object here is, is just some uh, phantom with, uh, with a dye in it, which produces optical contrast. But we're getting a 3D reconstruction. The, the key um, motivation here is to acquire the data as efficiently fast. So this is using a 16 times acceleration by only recording essentially every 16th of the data that we would do in a conventional raster scan. Now the reconstruction time is still quite, um, it's still several minutes because we're solving a iterative uh, optimization problem in 3D with a non-convex constraint. Oh, sorry, a smooth non-convex constraint. Uh, and then in particular, one of the motivations we had here was to move towards uh, dynamic imaging. So uh, here, uh, this uh, employed some of the concepts of spatial temporal regularization, for example, um, developed by uh, Berger, Dux, and Schenlieb, uh, which I think was for, for CT or Corolla may tell us afterwards. Um, and we applied this in this setting. And the idea is that uh, we now treat the reconstruction as a, as a 4D image of, of uh, spatial number of N of voxels and number of T samples in time. And the, the minimization here, A is our forward model, phi is our measurement pattern, which here are just random. Uh, and uh, y is the ith y is the uh, data at each point in time. Another regularization is imposed in some spatial temporal way. And one of the, the uh, appealing ways is uh, to use this optical flow constraint which says that the rate of change at uh, pixel time is given by the projection of the spatial gradient onto some uh, velocity field. And then the problem becomes one of recovery of this uh, so-called 4D image, space-time image, and the velocity field by imposing different regularizations. And so typically we would use um, TV-like reconstruction, uh, TV-like uh, constraints in the space domain on the velocity field and this optical, uh, and uh, I think L, it was L2 uh, constraint on this optical flow equation. Of course, uh, there are many other ways that we might reformulate that, for example, using optimal control methods and so forth. And so this, this topic of uh, joint image motion estimation is, is a very active one uh, in various uh, domains, including uh, MRI and PET. Uh, and this is by, by no means the only way to approach it. Nevertheless, this was uh, quite successful. And here we see one of the results uh, obtained and uh, 
in primarily due to uh, Felix Luca. Uh, where now is you're seeing the variation in the sampling pattern as a function of time. Uh, and the, the fact that it's arranged in this, it looks like these are lines rather than just random points is due to this parallelization, which I didn't talk about where we use uh, a parallel set of uh, optical readout from this interferometer. But nevertheless, uh, what one sees here is that we, we have in, in the kind of, uh, I would say classic uh, space-time compressed sensing setting, we are varying the pattern over time so that if you if you now threw away the time domain and just compressed, you know, just summed this over time, it would fully sample this output surface. And we're seeing different reconstructions here. This is the frame by frame reconstruction where we're using just TV on a image frame by frame. And here with the combined spatial temporal with TV on the uh, 40 image TV on the velocity and L2 constraint on the um, optical flow condition. And of course, when one does this, one has to have many tunable hyperparameters, which uh, of course um, takes some time to, to define correctly. Uh, I said I wouldn't say much about the learning approach, but I'd, I'll say one thing, and that is we were interested in, uh, well, in using a, a learning-based setting. And if one uses uh, the so-called unrolled method, where we have an iterative scheme uh, forward and backward or forward and adjoint uh, projecting in each iteration with a regularization. Uh, one has this cost of the forward and back projection operators, which is not cheap for bird acoustics, but we also have an extensive cost in the training because the training of a network like that means that uh, we have to optimize over the training set and passing through the forward and adjoint models many times. But if we now go back to this fast Fourier uh, setting that I mentioned as a fast reconstruction method, um, the, that can be written down in this way, is this is the uh, interpolation and scaling function. Uh, so I think it's the scaling and the interpolation function, uh, mapping you from uh, the kx, ky omega setting to kx, ky, that should be a kz. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is just the mapping from the um, KXKY omega to PXYT setting. Uh, and then uh, this is this solves the, the inverse problem. But so if we want to use this in iterative setting, we needed to solve this in the forward setting. But this means that we, when we look at this uh, scaling, function, uh, when we apply it in the forward setting, it has a singularity, uh, which makes uh, technically we, using this as a model for the forward problem is um, uh, not possible unless we take, unless we uh, regularize it in a certain way by, by cutting out the singularity. And this amounts physically to uh, assuming the waves are only arriving at certain angles, uh, not over the full angular range. Uh, and we, we can see this here. Um, if we use this fast forward model, uh, we obtain not a proper wave front set, but a kind of artifactual wave front set. And if we apply back projections of this, we get artifacts even before we apply any uh, amelioration due to regularization. Um, but Nevertheless, if we think of this in the learning context, uh, if you if you ask machine learning people to look at this, they will say, well, if I have a training set of images which are corrupted by uh, this kind of artifact uh, and I have the true image, which I could obtain with the uh, more expensive forward propagation uh, wave equation solver, uh, I could learn the solution to this relatively easily. So uh, we had, did some work well uh, here. In fact, we, we just simply applied this incorrect model uh, through this classic kind of uh, unit architecture in a multi-layer setting with an unrolling. And we obtained results. The key thing is uh, that we obtained results uh, with, with a much faster reconstruction time. So we went from uh, using the uh, classic optimization uh, 
that we showed before with TV regularization, it took about 10 minutes for 20 iterations, whereas with this uh, fast uh, approximate model and a learned reconstruction, about 20 seconds. And here, the, the reference where we fully sampled and used time reversal for comparison. Okay, so now I want to, uh, because I want to get to the, the new part, I want to say a few things about this, um, the second part, which is the uh, reconstruction of the optical signal with the, when, after the photoacoustic signal has been assumed reconstructed. So we go back to the uh, wave equation, uh, so the, the radiative transfer equation, which we wrote in this form, uh, and we want to take a, a, a derivative of this and use an agile model. We can uh, just do the normal approximation by taking a perturbation and finding this uh, Frechet derivative, which means that we can find the perturbed field by applying uh, a perturbation absorption scattering into the initial field and then resolving the uh, wave, uh, the radiative transport equation. Uh, so if we look at the simplified setting of an optical source, acoustic transducer, and the contrast uh, being produced in terms of this initial, this energy T positive H propagating the acoustic wave and detected in this sensor. Then to, to find the uh, gradient of this, we can just proceed by writing down a uh, data fitting term and taking the fresh air derivative of it. And after a few steps, we uh, can find that uh, we have to solve this uh, adjoint equation for this uh, difference between the observed and modeled energy multiplied by the absorption. And then if we proceed through that, we find this uh, expression for the gradient, which depends on two terms, this uh, difference in the data times the uh, field, and then this uh, special integral, uh, angular integral everywhere of the forward and the adjoint field. And in fact, this, this term here has a dominant effect. Uh, we show this only for the absorption term, for simplicity, there's an equivalent term for the scattering reconstruction as well. And then, uh, so the quite, a, quite some activity uh, has, has taken place on, uh, on uh, solving the QPAT problem. The problems using uh, the RTE model rather than the diffusion model are less available. Uh, here are some, some references. Uh, we've worked here with, with Tanya on her uh, RTE model in finite elements. I think Tanya was in the in the seminar today, and uh, we got uh, results which were which were quite intriguing. Where, where we we took some uh, distribution absorption scattering, we solved the problem with using the radiative transfer equation model versus the diffusion model, and we found that uh, you get a much more accurate reconstruction of the scattering parameter than uh, you do with the diffusion model. And a little, some insight into that is by look, getting, looking at the SVD of the fresh air derivative, uh, which, which we just do numerically. If we look at the um, SVD uh, with the diffusion equation, it decays uh, much more rapidly than the RTE. And this difference here, this sudden jump here, is uh, apparent from uh, this analytical form of the RT where most of the information is just due to the difference in the observations and only applies to the absorption. But if we want to find two parameters, absorption and scattering, the scattering is only indirectly inferred from the change in the field and its product with uh, between the forward and agile field. So it's, there's just a physically much less information is available for the scattering, whereas there's direct information in the data for the absorption. Nevertheless, the RT, use of the RTE ameliorates this uh, lack of information much better than it does for the diffusion equation. Okay, I think I may have enough time. Let, let me maybe skip that one. And let's say something about the ultrasound mod modulated optical tomography. So this now is um, a slightly more complicated setup where we have the optical source and the optical detector. 
Uh, but we also have this ultrasound source, which is producing the ultrasound focus in the interior. But what we want to reconstruct is not this ultrasound focus, but the contrast B. So we actually need to look at the information that propagates uh, from the boundary to the ultrasound focus and to the perturbation. Again, if I skip through one or two of those details, which are in some of the references, we set up a functional just the same. With Now we have this uh, in terms of the optical source density and the optical measurement density. Whereas with, uh, uh, QPAT, we only have to consider the one optical source, and we, the contrast is just the, pro, is the product of the absorption and the source radiance. Uh, here, it's a product of the uh, measurement and the, the uh, source optical fields and the ultrasound focus density. But nevertheless, what we obtain is something uh, similar, except that we now have to. Uh, express uh, the solution in terms of a forward field from the measurement and its adjoint and from the uh, source and its adjoint. So we lead to we expressions here. We have the uh, source position, the field due to the source, uh, the perturbation in that field uh, due to a contrast. Here's the measurement from the um, uh, detector and the perturbation due to that. And the sensitivity is the combination of the product of these two and these two. Uh, so this leads to the so-called uh, correlation measurement density functions, which essentially form the rows of the Jacobian that we can invert in a linear inversion. These are for absorption and these are for scattering. Uh, and this means that we have to take multiple uh, source and detector positions and uh, reconstruct uh, uh, separable images of absorption scattering. Okay, so finally, if I have a few minutes left, I would just like to mention this fully stochastic reconstruction idea. So, so far we saw that um, in the, in, the night, in the normal way of thinking, we have a quantitative coupled optical imaging, which uses an accurate forward model. The deterministic RT is computation expensive. Uh, the stochastic Monte Carlo modeling is arbitrarily accurate, but only in expectation, and it's not directly written in operator form. So uh, one approach is to run very high numbers of photons and uh, treat the re resulting field as a proxy for a deterministic RT solve. But what we've done uh, alternatively is to look at these uh, adapt the stochastic gradient methods, which is to treat now the Monte Carlo with very few photons as an approximate model. So the idea, uh, obviously from a normal gradient descent method, if we have a, a functional, we find its gradient and we use the gradient descent with possibly some acceleration terms. When we're in the stochastic setting, we can only expect uh, this to be true in, in, in expectation. So when we take a set of photons less, you know, anything less than infinity really, but less than some sufficiently high number, uh, we can say that the expectation of them is the objective function uh, and its gradient. So in the stochastic gradient descent methods, we take the descent but only using a subset of photons. Now in machine learning, that's normally taken as a subset of data. But here we can we uh, want to interpret it as a, just a subset of photon number, just to take the number of photons to be relatively small. And by rewriting this, we can say that uh, this subset uh, estimation of gradient is the true gradient plus some noise term. Uh, so the idea of the adaptive stochastic gradient descent is to say that um, if we run to uh, very high number of photons, this uh, random error should reduce to zero. So if we monitor the uh, variance of that, we can uh, try to m adapt the step size uh, to improve this accuracy based on either this norm test, which is just looking at the actual variance, or uh, look only at the variance uh, parallel to the descent direction, because this is uh, implied by saying that the steps in the uh, gradient that are tangent to the 
descent direction will have expectation zero. So we can, but so because we have a little bit short of time, let me skip one or two of these points and say that we, we can therefore use this adaptive method, which we could show pictorially here. So if we use a large number of photons, we have a descent direction. If we have a very small number of photons, we are maybe random walking around the solution. And if we do this adaptive method, we hope to converge to the solution more accurately. And this is monitored either by looking at the norm of the variance or the norm of the uh, sort of net variance parallel to the descent direction. So uh, let me, because we're a bit short of time, this is the algorithm. And let me just, and we can evaluate this for QPA and for PAT, but let's just skip some of these steps and show uh, this uh, result. So here uh, we have this true solution. This is now a one dimensional problem. This is the data. So the data is the product of this function mu a and the fluence. The fluence decays, which is why this data is decaying. So we, our task is to recover this from this. If I run this movie, what we're seeing now is the estimation using uh, this figure here, a very small number of photons, a thousand is very cheap. And as we iterate through, so uh, we increase this uh, photon count. And so we've achieved good re uh, results near the surface, but not very well in the uh, interior. And we need to increase this. As we monitor through this, we're now increasing the photon count. So the interesting thing, uh, which I, I can summarize, uh, is that um, by taking the, t the, the total number of photons that we're going to model and assigning it differently in different iterations, we can achieve this result in about the same cost as running the, the forward model in the first place. The total sum of the photons we send in is less than uh, or about equal to the total we used in generating the data. Uh, this is uh, summarizing those results. Again, we, I think we're a little short of time, so we should skip the details of that, which we can look at in the paper. And we do the same thing for UMOT and uh, get these results here. Okay, so I think I should stop. Um, I've talked about imaging from coupled acoustics and photoacoustics, different me methods for modeling, uh, exploiting compressed sensing. I mentioned a little bit about the idea of approximate models combined with learning and uh, introduced this idea of what we call fully stochastic inversion, where we're exploiting the stochastic nature of the forward model uh, with uh, a stochastic gradient. Method. And there were still some topics I didn't talk about one step reconstruction and multispectral. Okay, I think uh, there's some outlook here, and I should, I think the chat is telling me I should stop. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for your talk. We wish we had another half hour or more to uh, let you go on. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, I'm afraid it's a bad habit, uh, but I'd see one question in the. Uh, Yes, there is. Uh, uh, maybe we have time for a, a quick answer to a quick question. And uh, uh, Yuri, do you want to ask your question in person? I can uh, unmute you. Uh, let's see where are you located on my. Well, I'll, I'll read it out anyway. It says, um, I suppose you need to assume that the stochastic noise in your gradient decays faster than the step size. Uh, well, that's right. That's that's essentially how the art. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, you'd like to say that, but we can speak as well. Um, that's essentially. Yeah, I, I'm afraid it was a little brief there, but I can send you the paper with more details. Yes, um, that is true. So uh, that so by the idea is that uh, in the initial stage of the algorithm, I mean that this is the general framework of subsets algorithms. Uh, you tolerate a, an error in the gradient. You take larger steps that are getting you closer to the, the uh, minimum. But as you converge towards the minimum, you increase the number of subsets. Now, so in the classic machine learning framework, or this has also been applied in, in other settings like uh, PET, uh, you, you have the option to go to using the full data eventually as you converge so that the uh, the stochastic noise due to the subsampling is zero. In this case, it's not true because we will always have stochastic noise no matter how many photons. But we can, of course, be predictive about what 
uh, what it will be. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then the step size is going to uh, decrease as it will um, anyway, as you converge towards the minimum. I don't know if that fully answers your question. All right, maybe we have time for a quick, uh, as, as long as uh, nobody cuts the uh, antenna, uh, uh, we may still take a few questions if uh, uh, there is any. Uh, raise your hand or, or uh, uh, use a chat box. Okay. Yes, maybe you can see me. I may have a naive question for you, Simon. Uh, this idea of uh, uh, modulated uh, uh, or modulating the, the rigidity of the medium using ultrasound, mm -hmm. uh, you combine that with uh, an optical source uh, to uh, um, and uh, uh, is there another way to, uh, or, but then you, you'd have all the, the, all the cons of uh, uh, using light to, uh, to carry information out of the medium because of scattering effects, because of uh, uh, small penetration depths and so forth. So would there be another way to uh, use this mechanism of, uh, 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 well, ultrasound modulation is used in other areas as well. I believe it's used in EIT. Um, and I mean, it's also essentially used in, in elastography, although, I mean, it's, it wouldn't be called ultrasound though, because it's usually much, much lower, lower frequency uh, sound waves to, to, to obtain the sort of mechanical deformation. Uh, I'm sure there's one or two EIT experts on the call. Uh, I haven't seen much practical uh, developments of that. Uh, the, 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 the thing that, the, that makes optical uh, methods so sort of appealing to people is because the contrast is so rich, uh, because if you, you can take the, the, the source of light and tune it across the optical spectrum, and then you can, so you can look at uh, all kinds of different what are called chromophores. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the classic one people mostly look for is is blood, uh, oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. So your your the blood in your arteries, which is bright red, the blood in your veins is is like a purple color. And uh, this is why people are, are very compelled by this uh, idea of, of making of achieving optical imaging. Uh, because the, the benefits in the contrast are so rich, uh, even though your, uh, uh, your resolution is normally very bad. But here the resolution is, is essentially controlled by the, by the optical focus. So that, that fixes one part of the problem. If you could make the focus you know, very, very fine, then you, would, you could achieve as much resolution as you like. Then, of course, the contrast has to be carried through. But the contrast is actually achieved by looking... I mean, again, I couldn't talk about the details of that too much, but you're looking at the harmonic variation here. So we take the Fourier transform and we look at the modulation of the uh, sideband frequency of the uh, Fourier transform in time of this optical signal. So this eliminates uh, the main problem, which is the background. Like often the problem in, in optical imaging is you're looking for a tiny change in contrast on a very strong background. It's like look, looking at a, a sort of sheet uh, after, after you've washed it and held it out in the sun and looking for a, a tiny uh, change in pattern on this very bright background. And then there, I mean, there are many, many ways, particularly using fluorescence of people, bioluminescence. People okay. have looked for this, but this is another way because you're, you're eliminate, you're cutting out the background light by uh, looking at the uh, off, by cutting out the DC frequency in the, in the modulation of that, then for a transform. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, mm -hmm. ultrasound EIT is definitely something that people have looked into, at least from a theoretical point of view, but I'm not sure that it's been realized. I see. Because here it, it sounded like a, a, your paradigm of coupling two uh, mechanisms one that has uh, one, one, one uh, which is sensitive to contrast, but uh, highly diffusive, and uh, the other one uh, which is uh, 
uh, which has good resolution, but uh, doesn't quite feel the medium. Uh, it, it seems like in this modality, you're using it backwards in a way. Um, well, that's true. Yes, that's true. Uh, but we're still, the, you know, the, the image that you reconstruct is still an optical contrast measurement. Right. And, and yeah, it's, so you're not directly reading out acoustic signal, that's true. Right. But you are modulating it, the resolution of the acoustics pertain, you know, uh, dictates the resolution of the optics that you're going to reconstruct because it dictates, it uh, focuses this location of the contrast. Right. It, it's, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it is a bit, yeah, it's, it's not it's quite It's differential as, imaging. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's differential imaging. And it's not quite as sort of, uh, it's not quite as, um, Fits in fits into the what I said at the beginning about reading out one with contrast from the other. That's that's true. All right. Well, I'm looking at the chat box, and I think uh, people are out of questions. Uh, any further questions? Well, if not, uh, Simon. Uh, Simon, thank you so much again for. Uh, this very nice talk, and uh, we hope to see you all next week for another of our okay. uh, interesting okay. imaging seminars. Uh, and uh, thank you again, Simon, and uh, 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 wish you well, everybody, and uh, see you next week then for another uh, round of this show. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye bye. All right.